lost without hope, with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Past was redeemed, only beauty remains. And my orphan heart was given. Morning grew quiet when my feet rose to end. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have been. It's your endless love pouring down on us. You have made us new now. Life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm afraid to pray. Darkness rejoices, there's no heaven at months, I thought you looked better than what you do now. Um, 
Yeah, no doubt. And I see some new faces, and that just makes me real happy. Makes me real happy. Y'all repeat after me, there's only one God. And it's not you. There's only one God. And it's not me. There's only one God. It's not my money. There's only one God. It's not my honey. There's only one God. It's not my politics. It's only one God. It's not my religion. There's only one God. It's not my church. There's only one God. It's not the Bengals. There's only one God. He got his love. He got his peace. He got his mercy. He got his truth. It's right here. Right now. It's good to see you guys. Yeah. You know, I was thinking well, there's probably all sorts of reasons why you're here today. I'm here because um, Rick asked me to come preach. And uh, he said the 30th weren't good because, you know, congratulations to um, Dave and Christine who got married last night and um, started their new life together. Prayers for them. And, and hopefully this is a, a Sunday of, of recovery for Rick and, and the team. I know weddings are take a lot of energy. Um, so I don't know why you're here today. Uh, I think it's important to come back to our intention all the time. Why do we do what we do? Why are we in relationships? If we're single, why are we single? If we're married, why are we married? If we work, why do we work? Why do we come here? There's so much else you could be doing. Um, why are you here today? And I guess for a lot of this, we may never know because we may never really think about it. But we're all here together now. Okay? So I'm going to ask you for 33 minutes of attention. Actually, like 33 minutes and about 14 seconds. If you can give me your attention for about 33 minutes and 14. Yeah. Yeah, and after 20, if you want to leave, that's, that's fine. Um, I would think if you've gotten used to Rick's preaching 33 minutes, you'd say, hey, we're going to make the frishes on time today. <laughs> Sorry, Rick. <laughs> so I just want to invite you just to listen to this teaching. And it's, it's really about Jesus' approach to life, which is what I think the gospel is. It's about how to live. Um, too often, I think, our minds are somewhere else. And we can be so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good. And um, when you, you look at the gospel, when you look at Jesus' teachings... I think he's really talking about how do I perceive the kingdom of God now? Now. It's not something that we're waiting for this one day that then I'll go fly away. You know, as much as I love that song. The invitation is the kingdom of God now. And I, and I think we just have to ask some basic questions. Do you want that? I mean, do you want to be more wise? Do you want to be more loving? Do you want to be less miserable, less neurotic? And if you say no, then I just have to ask the question, why the heck are you here? If that's not what you want, why are you here? So uh, I'm going to offer some thoughts, a teaching. Just listen to see if there's something in this teaching that can help you and that you can take away and you can put into practice. Because... We can't hit it enough. Hearing's not enough, guys. You know? I can hear about what I should be eating, or what I shouldn't be eating. It's about what I, I put into practice. So even if you only identify as like, Brian, I'm just really like a 2% Christian, that's okay, man. Just take away 2% of the teachings this morning and see if it can help you. That's where you start. And what you'll notice, if you pay attention, is I'm not going to ask you to believe anything. Because I don't think Jesus asks us to believe. He asks us to follow. I think we have too many Christians who just simply believe. And they believe because that's what they've been taught. That's what they were raised in. And so this is what I believe. But they're unexamined beliefs. They haven't asked the hard questions. They haven't had a sense of curiosity. And to me, this is just wrong. So I don't want you just to believe. The gospel is not something just to be believed. It's to be lived. Okay? 
is the difference between reading how to ride a bike and then getting off your butt and getting on a bike and going out and riding and falling over and scraping your knee. There's a big difference between the two. We have too many people who can quote scripture and they, they know how you should ride a bike, but when it comes to it, they don't know a damn thing about getting on the bike and doing it because they're afraid, excuse me, I just gotta cuss every once in a while. <laughs> they're afraid of the pain. What do we have up here? You're afraid of the pain? And you call yourself a follower of Christ? So I, I can't emphasize enough that the gospel, Jesus' teachings, are immensely practical. Okay? They're not just something there for like intellectual curiosity. It, it, to me, it, it's like a recipe. When I open the scriptures, it's like a recipe. And I don't know if a recipe's any good until I do what? You gotta get into the kitchen, and you gotta put the ingredients in, you gotta make a mess, and you gotta bake it. And after you bake it, and if you try it and you don't like it, then you have good reason to reject the recipe. Right? If you take the, the teachings of Jesus and you put them into practice, and they absolutely don't work for you, then you have really good reason to say, Brother Brian, I reject this. And I say, intellectually, I respect that. Because you've, you, you've tried it. But for the people that are just saying, yeah, I believe, I believe, I believe, but they haven't put it into practice, I, I just think that's like not growing up in the faith. I think we're just, you know, as, as Paul would say, we're just sucking on milk. You know, we, we got to get to the meat. I think the, the, the Church of Jesus Christ could do much better if we had people who not ask the question so much, do I believe this is true? Like some sort of just like intellectual thing. Um, is it does it work in my life? Does it work? Am I, as you kind of look at it, am I becoming a kinder person? And the way to find out, I always look at spiritual growth as are you easier to live with? You know? Is that if it doesn't work at that kind of practical level, if there's not more love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, you know, self-control, then we might just be believing Christians, but not practicing Christians. Um, too often, and you can kind of hear this with, with very religious folks, they just believe what they believe because that's what they believe. That's fundamentalism right there. I believe what I believe simply because I believe. And so you have Muslim fundamentalists, and they're absolutely sure because they've been taught what to believe just as if you were raised in the church. Just different beliefs. And then you have like fundamentalist Muslim and a fundamentalist Christians and they're like arguing at each other and it's like, that's just stupid. It's not about what you believe, it's what you live. Now beliefs are important, they get you going, but it's what you actually do that counts. Seems to me that when, when it comes to the things of God, too often somehow we lose our common sense. Just basic kind of Common sense, which to me, common sense is like the wisdom of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. You know, I don't think it's this mystical thing out there, or if it is, it absolutely bypasses me because I've been a follower of Jesus ever since I was a little kid. It just seems that when the Holy Spirit moves, it's just this really basic kind of common sense in touch with reality of what's going on. And I just don't think sometimes that we, we look at the teachings of Jesus as if they need to be practical. Maybe we just want to come to worship and get a little bit excited, a little bit moved, hear a nice, nice worship song, um, get inspired, get comforted. Maybe we pick up a couple of things we believe about God and Jesus, just, you know, cherry pick. The ones that, that, that make us comfortable. And the teachings of Jesus that don't require anything of us, it doesn't cost anything, we take those, we put those in our little bag, and then we leave worship, and then we believe, oh, I'm a Christian because I believe certain things. Sometime I really get in the gospel and look and, then, and see if that's what it says it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, that you just have to believe certain things. So we gather, we sing, we pray, we hear scriptures, that's all good. Guys, that's the... That's the scaffolding of building the house. And if all we do is, is just deal with the scaffolding, that's religion. And religion is good. We need it. We need the scaffolding to build the house. But we, we got to go deeper. When you build the scaffolding, you don't build the scaffolding to live on the scaffolds. scaffolding. You build the scaffolding in order to build 
the house of faith, the house of, of, of God in here. So we gotta look at the implication of what we say we believe, which just means we gotta bring our common sense to the table. I think God enjoys being investigated. I don't think God wants us to believe just like, you know, you're a kid and you believe it's in Santa just because mom and dad say it. Um, I think there's this invitation to go beyond just merely believing. So what I want to share this morning, I mean, agree or don't agree. Actually, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. It really doesn't. But before you drop it or before you carry it, try it out. Okay? Think of the psalmist. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Don't just believe in the goodness of the Lord while it feels like your life is going to hell in a handbasket. Taste and see. Okay? We good? We're on the same page? Okay? And, and again, if you don't like it, that's fine. And if it offends you, get up and walk out. That's really okay. Doesn't hurt my feelings. Um, I have worked for over 40 years as a counselor, a, a teacher, and a pastor. Uh, and many, many people have come to me with stories of hopelessness. They're just so disheartened that they genuinely believe that they have no real chance of freeing themselves from their issues. And one of the biggest issues is that they don't believe that they have issues. They believe that you have issues. They believe that I have issues. And that's where most folks kind of, that's their default mode, is if, is if I'm upset, it's not because of this in here, it's because of you, you know? And so we, we spend a lot of our, our time thinking that our, both our joy and our struggle is outside of ourselves, you know? And so we end up giving up responsibility for our life. If I'm angry, it's because you made me angry. That's the word of a victim. And as we just were singing about in resurrection, there are no victims in God. Even if you were victimized as a child, you were victimized then, you're not being victimized now. And if you're being victimized now, get the hell out of that relationship, okay? You shouldn't put yourself in a place where you're being victimized. Beyond that, you're no victim. And so every time we look outside of ourselves as the source of, of either my struggles, my problems, or my joy, um, we are denying our own responsibility. So a lot of people struggle and they're hurting just because they don't really have the humility or the courage to say, yeah, this is my stuff. This is my stuff. Other people have come and they talk about the traumas that they carry. Difficult childhood, a parent who was not there for them, a useful transgression that they can't get over, uh, an abusive or failed relationship, addictions, loss, just all the messy things in life. That, that, that can leave us feeling like a failure or irredeemably hurt and lost. The reason I mention this is, that, is that it's helpful to remember that the people who interacted with Jesus in the gospel stories, they had all these issues and struggles as well. We have a tendency to, to kind of look at them as almost like flannel board cutout figures. It's, it's, it's not real. Um, but these were real people, just like you, just like me. Just as, as messed up and as struggling as, as all of us here. And what we're going to see today is that in Jesus' interaction with them, Jesus was not concerned about teaching orthodox doctrine at all. Um, he was not trying to make people toe some religious line or, or to fit into some way that the, 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 the culture, the, the religious culture, the political culture thought that you should be. Jesus' focus continually is about healing. It's about healing our relationship with ourselves and our relationship with our idea of God that then should flow out in healing our relationships this way. And, and often his approach is not very comforting. Okay? Now sometimes Jesus was kind of nice. You know? There's a couple of times he says, you know, all you are... You know, laden and heavy, whatever. You know, come to me and I'll give you a rest. That was sweet. Jesus didn't say a whole lot of sweet things like that. Right. You know, right. if you're really honest, you really look what he says. is like, dang, man, that wasn't very nice at all. <laughs> and that's what we're going to see th this morning is, and one of the things that, that he kind of does uh, habitually 
um, is he directs people's attention away from fixating on other people, on things outside of themselves, and he directs their attention towards their own stuff, their own growth, their own development. And that's where the title of this message comes. It's not them, it's you. Okay? Say that with me. It's not them, it's you. So if you forget anything else, you remember the title of, of the message, there's meaning in that. Okay, we are in Luke chapter 13, um, just five verses. We're just going to kind of buzz through these. Um, there were some at that very time who told him, him being Jesus, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now we're not told any backstory about this. We're not told why they told him that what they were trying to do we don't even hear anything about the story but what you can kind of figure is that Pilate had taken some Jews who had come in for sacrifice at the temple he had murdered them um, taken their blood pretty horrific and then mingled it with the, the blood that they had brought for atonement for their sins so the blood of a, of a dove or a, a lamb or a sheep or something like that pretty pretty gruesome and, but they don't say why they're asking, but we sort of get it in verse 2. Jesus sort of susses it out. And Jesus answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? So he kind of susses out that the reason you're asking that is that you want to focus on them and their sin. You know? So the bad stuff happened to them because they were sinners. They were worse sinners than us. I know that you don't have that tendency to look at other people's sin and judge them. Right? And you haven't noticed that the, that the judgment that you bring on other people, what annoys you about other people down deep is the very quality and the very sin you're harboring in your heart? You ever notice that? Yeah. So Jesus answers them and says, so, so do you think this is what it is? Did they suffer in this way? Verse, verse 3. No, I tell you. Now look what he does. Man, he's just not nice. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And I can I, I get just imagine people like, how did we get to me? I wanted to talk about those people. It's like when I, when I was counseling full time, very often the, the wife would come in and, and, and you know, want to gripe about their spouse. Again, I know that never happens to anybody here in Cobblestone. But they would want to gripe about their spouse. And I'd give them about 10 minutes, and I would get kind of impatient. i said, look, your husband's not here. Let's talk about you. And then they didn't seem to have so much to talk about anymore. So Jesus kind of turns their focus around. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. And then Jesus goes on. I'm going to give you a freak another example. Or what about those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them? Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? Verse 5. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. This is our tendency, isn't it? Jesus, I want to, I'm going to pray for this person. Sometimes you ever notice that, that our prayer can almost be like gossip with God, you know? I want to talk about this person. This person was rude to me, so God changed them. And Jesus, no, let's, let's don't talk about them. Let's talk about why you get so offended when somebody's rude to you. Why do you expect that nobody should ever be rude to you? Um, why are you so attached to your own self-image and your own ego and how you think sh things should be? That nobody should ever be rude to me. Everybody should love me. Jesus just takes it and just in a moment says, no, let's, let's look at you. Um, don't turn your focus to others. Let's look at you. Jesus is very consistent about that. Get the log out of your own eye before you want to deal with the speck in another's eye. See, I think this is really like clear underlying teaching is that Jesus' concern for you is you. If you want to experience the kingdom of God, it's not trying to get me to change. It's not trying to get other people to change. It's you. It's your heart. It's your habits. It's all those areas that you absolutely re refuse to bring discipline to and then you piss and moan about everybody else. And he just interrupts that and says, no, it's you, Sherlock. We're not going to talk about those 18. We're not going to talk about those Galileans that Pilate killed. Let's deal with your own stuff. Man, that's, 
That's tough. Because quite frankly, that's hard. It's easy to sit back and point. I can look and see dysfunctional people everywhere, right? I'm sure you can too. Think about your family. Think about the holidays coming up with your family. Think about the election that's coming up in the next week and a half. You know? Look at your coworkers. Dysfunction, dysfunction, dysfunction. But very rarely do we like, oh, I just need to like concern myself with me. And that's all Jesus is saying. Look at your need for change, your repentance, your need for growth. Engage with your own skeletons in the closet, um, your own insecurities. Let's deal with your fears, your anger, your bitterness, your mouthiness. Let's deal with that. Because he understands that our very worst enemy is not Satan. That's my worst enemy. Okay. Um, once we sort of wake up to the fact that God is alive in us, Satan has no power at all, except for what we give. I'm not worried about Satan at all. Satan's already been defeated. I have no issue. My issue is with me. You know, I'm my own worst enemy. I realized in about 2005, uh, as I was walking in the woods. And I realized that I've been carrying this list in my head probably since I was about 24, 25. I don't know if you've had a list that you carry, but my list was titled, What's Wrong with Brian? You know? And I actually sat down and made a long list of everything that was wrong with me. You got a list, not what's wrong with me, you know. <laughs> don't really care. Um, do you have a what's wrong with you list? And if you've never written it down, I guarantee you that if you have any sense of self-awareness at all, you're going to have some things that it's like, oh, yeah, I do have some things, you know. There's stuff that before I look and, and point out what's wrong with everybody else, how about I just deal with my own stuff? And we don't do that to, like, beat ourselves up. Or like, oh, Brian, you just want me to feel bad. Um, no, it's like honest self-reflection. It's just like growing up. Um, and it's important because you and I can spend a lifetime wondering about others. And totally miss out on the promised blessing because your own heart is a mess. And then we would kind of make that list. It was such a graced moment when I could make all that list of all the things that really repulsed me about me. And then offer compassion to every part of me. Because God loves every part of me. God loves every part. There is not a part of you that is not saturated, that is not drenched in God's love and God's forgiveness. And when that becomes a reality in, in, in you, that you're not trying to cut off pieces of yourself, then you have something to offer the world that the world desperately needs. It's called agape, unconditional love. Now notice that Jesus says to repent not once, twice. Seems to me whenever he says something more than once, we'd be wise to listen up. And we've, we've kind of screwed up, I, I think, in, in America, um, Christianity. We've kind of screwed up the whole idea of, of repentance. Um, repentance is really a change of mind. Right? And if that's probably one of the hardest things. Once you're sure that you know what you know, and you're absolutely sure that you're right, you know, um, trying to change our minds is very difficult. I don't know if you've ever had the joy of trying to speak like some facts to a, um, what do they call them, a conspiracy theorist? Has anybody had the joy of trying to? That, that, that really is it. Our government is so inept, the idea that they could actually be like hiding these things for like 20 years and they're somehow, you know, killing babies and drinking their blood and all this. You try and have like a rational conversation with somebody and it's like, but you call yourself a Christian, but you won't even change your mind. You, you just got this one thing off of a website, and you're sure that it's absolutely true. We have the gospel. Right? So changing our mind is hard work. You want to talk about dying to yourself? Then start to just deal with this fact is that maybe I'm not as smart as what I think I am. Maybe my viewpoint is just my viewpoint, and it's not universal truth. And that's what change of mind, that's, that's what repentance, it, it begins with a change of mind, seeing things different, seeing other people different. And that results in a change of action. And that's all Jesus is saying. Hey, instead of con conjecturing on the Galilean sin, 
Focus on your own. Where is your thinking crooked? What are the idols that, that you're worshiping in your own little head? Where are you deluded? Do you notice your attachment to your own self-image? So, so rather than assigning wickedness to those who are killed by the Tower of Siloam, examine your own heart. Examine your own patterns. In other words, it's not them. It's you. It's always you. Do you understand that, the gospel? It's always you. You know why it is? Because you're important. It's always you. This is the medicine for our sickness. Repentance. Dealing with ourselves. Please understand, Jesus is, is always concerned with you and I finding healing. And most of the time, in order to find healing, we have to take some bitter medicine. Back right after, I guess it was early September, um, Susan and I had COVID. She had it for a long time. I had it for a short time, but I had it really intense. Like I was wanting them to take me to the hospital. And, and I guess if you're old enough and sick enough, they have this one certain medicine. They don't give it to anybody like under 50 or 55, but they have this medicine called Paxovid. I don't know if anybody's had the joy of taking that. It, 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 it makes, did it make everything like taste metal to you? It's like for, for, for this whole long period, uh, everything I ate, I had to go 10 days without drinking a light beer. It was difficult. I knew I was healed when I could finally drink beer and it didn't taste like I was drinking metal again. But it got me better. Is it the, the, the nature of healing is, is that we often need to take some bitter medicine. Jesus is referred to as the great physician. To me, it's the great therapist. And a physician comes to those, he says, who are sick. So who here is sick? All of us. Your boss is sick. Your spouse is sick. Your annoying mother-in-law is really sick, right? <laughs> but a lot of us just don't realize that we're sick. We see it in others. And that's why we think, well, that's part of your sickness. Yeah? So I came up, you know, it, for any of you who say, well, you know, I'm not sick. I have my stuff together. Well, let's find out. I got a couple questions for you, okay? You probably don't want to answer this out loud. Do you pretend to be more loving than what you really are? Do you pretend to be more loving than what you really are? I sometimes think, what if, like, every time we had a thought, it could be, like, like broadcasted on our forehead so everybody saw it? Like if, if, if people can see, is there like alignment between how you, you act and what you say and what you're thinking up here? Okay. Do you long for joy and peace and then do the very things that destroy your joy and peace? Okay. That's a little crazy, guys. Do you give to others, but often with an agenda to get some sort of reward or recognition? That's not giving, that's a transaction. Do you say that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, but absolutely refuse to love your enemies? Those who annoy you. Those you disagree with. Do you have very little control over your thoughts, actions, or mouth? And the sixth one to me is, is, is the, sort of the, the, the nail in the coffin. Are you learning to see reality through the eyes of God? Say, well, what does that look like? I, I think it looks like this. See, you see everybody as your child. Everybody. My two brothers are here, Dave and Tim, from um, Bend, Oregon, and Savannah, Georgia. We, we've got, we get together, you know, as long as our health um, holds out, we get together and do a brother's camp, and we just wrap that up. And, and I love my two brothers very much. Uh, they were my idols growing up. They taught me everything that I knew. I, I wanted to get better at anything just to beat them. Um, when my dad was, was away on business a lot, it was, it was Dave and Tim that were there for me and, and really taught me what it meant to be a man. Um, but until I can love even the stranger the way I love my brothers, I'm sick. I still have work to do. It's not unconditional love. It's attachment. There's a big difference between attachment and unconditional love. Jesus drops this just big old bomb in the midst of his teachings when he says, you must be perfect 
like our Father in heaven is perfect. We have a tendency to kind of dance around that one. Because for a lot of us, we sort of think of that in terms of morality and maybe, you know, that uh, just trying to like, you know, dot all the I's and cross all the T's. And we should be moral people. But Jesus isn't talking about perfection in the terms that you never make a mistake or you know what the capital of Guatemala is. That's not the perfection that he's talking about. I think it's the, um, the perfection of God is to have a big heart, a boundless heart, boundless compassion. For God so loved the Christians, so God so loved America, so God so loved. So I just got to ask you, how are you doing with those? How are you doing with those? I think when we begin to see things from God's point of view, um, and it just takes work. I don't know any other way. I have just prayed and kept waiting for the spirit to zap me so I didn't have to do all the hard work. It doesn't work that way. Okay, dying to yourself is painful. And so that, that when we start like, starting to see things, maybe a little more like we have those God grace moments that having a big heart, then we just want to live a life in which we want to bring forth only goodness for other people in other people. Okay? We're not thinking about our own goodness anymore because we know that's a trap. That all the happiness in the world comes from, from seeking to be a blessing to other people and all the misery in the world comes from me just wanting pleasure and I want to hold it on just for myself. So it's trying to break out of that selfish cocoon. So then when adversity comes our way, we choose not to strike out in anger or fear, but we choose to allow our struggles to soften our heart. And make us kind. Because that's what struggles do. If you've had great struggles, you are blessed. Because great struggles can lead to great compassion. But if you don't allow it to lead to great compassion, then you're just stuck with the suffering of the struggles. So let me ask you, why are you here on this planet? What's your purpose? Is there something more to life than just, you know, paying bills? Going to Cheesecake Factory every once in a while, you know? <laughs> Watching the Buckeyes win? Well, that was pretty good. I think we are here, and I think it's pretty clear in the Gospels that we're here very simply to receive the love that is God. And then having received that, to work to drive away the sorrows of the world. And that's everybody. Just like Jesus. Just like Jesus. So it's about being perfect in love, like God, to imitate Jesus. Jesus said, you'll do greater things, a greater love. So again, how are you doing? Are you sick or well? See, I think when we realize our own sickness, then we have absolutely no solid ground ever to criticize another human being. Because our own heart is so polluted. When compassion has become so sacrificed in our life to self-interest where we love our own self-interest more than driving away someone's sorrow. You know, sometimes when I think about the love of God, it's just so active and alive in Jesus and it's been shown to me by so many people in my almost 63 years. I can cry just out of gratitude. You know? But then I look at my own constricted heart and I cry, but not out of gratitude, out of sorrow for my fearfulness, for my lack of courage, for my love of comfort. So again, how are you doing? Are you perfect in love for all people, regardless of who they are, of what you think that they have said or done? Are you perfect in love of all people, no matter their color, their politics, sexual orientation, sin, or political ideology? Do you wish to do whatever you can to set them free from sorrow and suffering? And I think with that question, there's really two groups of people. There are people that will just put their head down and say, that sounds too hard, and I, 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 I'm going to walk away. Just like folks walked away when Jesus talked about eat my body and you know, who, can, who can deal with that. There's another group of people, and that's a small group of people. That's not the masses. Is that when they hear that challenge, they say, hell yeah, that's what I want. I'm nowhere close to it, but that's what I want. That's the Jesus I want. That's the kind of life I want to live. I want to be challenged. I want to step up. I want to be extended out of my own selfishness. 
And I would say, guys, that that's just the way of Jesus. There's no middle ground in that. Um, it's the narrow path that Jesus calls us all to. Don't believe the, 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 the popular cycle babble hop, babble junk, that love can be easy. Love is not easy. Compassion, not easy. Kindness, not easy. But here's the hook. It's the only path to happiness. And maybe that's why there's so many people that are unhappy. As they keep waiting for God to give to them. And God is waiting on them to actually step outside of their fearful heart and get to the work for which they were born, which is unconditional love and wise compassion. So Jesus challenges our minds, most cherished belief, all of our self-imposed limitation. He calls us to more. No, you can be perfect. If Jesus didn't mean it, he wouldn't have said it. But it begins with repentance, not in the American evangelical version where we make some sort of commitment in an altar, but then continue living same old, same old. Like we're victims and we're just waiting for God to do something in us. No, we make a, a commitment to change. We make a commitment to deal with ourselves, my sin, my fault, my defects. And I do it not to make myself more acceptable. I already know I'm accepted, so I can do it out of freedom. I want to free myself from myself in order to be a benefit to other people. Did you get that? I want to be free from Brian Beckett. Because there's something bigger than Brian Beckett in me. There's something bigger in you. Jesus refers to it as working out your salvation. I don't know about you, but, but when I could work out, the workouts were never fun. It was always afterwards, you know? The working out, the spiritual disciplines, the hard work, you're not going to feel good about it, the whole thing because it's hard work. The joy comes afterwards. Though the sorrow may last for the night, joy comes in the morning. And Jesus tells us, you can do it. Paul echoes it. He says, discipline your mind. Like fighter disciplines his body. It's possible. We can actually work with God's help to uproot the afflictions in our mind. Uproot the afflictions in our heart. But we got to think bigger. I remember years, years and years ago, I think Dave was when you were preaching up at Lima Trinity. You, you had a sermon called, How Big Is Your God? How Big Is Your God? How Big Is Your God? Is your God bigger than your little mind? Is your God bigger than your past? Is your God bigger than your fears, anxieties, your love of comfort? Can we like start to get a vision for how can I think beyond my own private happiness? Because ultimately a private happiness is no happiness at all. We seek to end our own personal suffering so that we can help others put an end to theirs. This is the essence of the path. Can you just imagine opening your heart in an inconceivably big way, in a limitless way that benefits everyone you encounter? I think true followers of Jesus Christ seek even in adversity to bring forth only goodness. Is that your mindset? I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up and we're going to just have a time of a confessional prayer. But as they're coming up, I just want to remind you of, of a real basic thing. You are created in the image of God. You're created not in sin. Okay. God doesn't make junk. You were created in the image of God. That means that you are born a king or a queen. But you act like you're a beggar. Please know that you are rich with priceless gifts. You lack Nothing. God is not holding back anything, but sometimes you seem to believe that you have nothing. That's a poverty mentality. All's been given to you by a very generous creator. So I'm going to ask you to do this, and if it helps to close your eyes, um, close your eyes. I would ask you that if it, this is what you want to do, it's just to express to yourself and God your regret for hurting other people.
confess your addiction to self-cherishing, thinking of yourself first, what you want, when what you are willing to do to get it, even if it means stepping on others. There's no place to be rude for one another, towards one another, especially when we say we're doing it for Jesus. Maybe take a moment to confess with some wise shame for having such a small heart. I invite you to confess that maybe you've closed your heart to the sufferings of others and have felt quite justified in doing so. Now, I would encourage you to, as you work at it, to allow ample time for change to occur. It takes work. One of my ongoing practices has been to stop having an almost, lack of a better word, almost a hatred type of, type of feeling for some political leaders. There's some I just want to punch in the face. Um, I'm still not doing too good, but I'm doing better. I'm not caving in. So don't lose heart because the process of repentance transformation goes slowly. Finally, I, I would, would invite you to make a determination to live beyond the I want, I need mantra of self-absorption. To overcome clinging to self and in its place develop a generous mind where we think, what do you want? What do you need? How can I serve you? And guys, we, we got to make a choice. Decide and don't vacillate. Let's get off the religious Christian fence and set our feet down firmly on the path of Jesus Christ. Let's quit distract, distracting ourselves with foolishness and looking around at what others are doing or saying or acting. Because remember, it's not them. It's you. Now I have at the bottom of the, the study guide, it's called, I wrote this, it's called a prayer of a spiritual warrior. You don't have to say this with me. You don't have to pray it with me. Okay? It takes courage to pray this. Okay? It takes some guts. It takes some willingness to absolutely endure pain for the blessing of others. So if you have a copy of that, if you want to pray this with me, it's very, very simple. Prayer of the spiritual warrior together. Blessed Lord, give me the suffering of all beings who feel pain, and I will bear them as my own. I pray that again. Blessed Lord, give me the suffering of all beings who feel pain. I will bear them as my own. One more time, this frees a holy number. Blessed Lord, give me the suffering of all beings who feel pain, and I will bear them as my own. Because just as we have been drenched in love, we get to go drench the world. Yeah.
Yeah, there is power.